So what isn't your church telling you that Jesus desperately wants you to know? When most people study Jesus' great end-time sermon, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, they focus on the end-time signs that he gave us in that passage. But they usually stop right there. And somewhat understandably, as the disciples had just asked for a sign of his coming, so that's the first piece of information Jesus gave them. He gave them multiple signs, but then he did what Jesus always does. He applied the information, giving the disciples five parables and several more illustrations to help them understand what they were supposed to do in the end times. I mean, it's good to know the end times are upon us and where we are in the end times, and we learn those from the signs, but it's more important to know what to do about it, how to react, what steps to take. So Jesus spent more time describing those instructions for the end times than he did on the signs. That's what we're talking about today, and we're starting right now. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't recognize the signs. They are the roadmap, so to speak, of where we are and what happens next. But as we mentioned, unfortunately, that is where most Christians stop. They get bogged down in the signs of Matthew 24, verses 4 through 31, debating the signs, etc. And they pay very little attention to the parables and illustrations that follow them. All the rest of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25 are Jesus' applications so we can navigate the end times. And guess what? Every one of those applications are things you and I should be doing right now. So let's get started. As a quick summary review of the signs, they were deception, false prophets and messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, the great falling away, and then the cosmic signs of the sixth seal. Then Jesus told his first parable, the fig tree parable. This was very, very appropriate because the night before, Jesus had cursed the fig tree, and that very morning, the disciples had come upon it and learned that the tree had withered and dried up. So when Jesus said these words, learn the parable of the fig tree, this image of this withered fig tree was burned into their minds. Also burned into their minds is the scathing seven woes Jesus had just laid on the religious leaders in Jerusalem, leaving them with the words that their house was being left to them desolate. The disciples were smart guys, and they were putting two and two together, realizing that the fig tree was the nation of Israel. And in the fig tree parable, Jesus indicated that Israel would sprout new leaves someday. And that would be a sign that Jesus' return was near. Of course, the sprouting of new leaves happened in 1948. So since then, his return is near. It's been near for 70 years. So this is essentially the first sign. Jesus then gave us the second sign, or final sign, so to speak. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. This final sign is all the signs in the Olivet Discourse lumped together. Jesus told his followers that when they see all these things happen, he is right at the door. But Jesus didn't say how close he was after that. But he did say, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Jesus' followers will never know the exact day or hour of Jesus' return. They just can't know it with that level of specificity. They can't know the day or the hour. If you think about it, this explanation by Jesus helps us understand his rather contradictory statements that we are to both watch and be alert. At the same time, we are to know that he will come when we don't expect it. How can both be true? Keep those ideas in mind as we work through the rest of the parables and you'll see how that plays out. Next, Jesus gave his followers an illustration from the life of Noah for as were the days of Noah, 
so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus uses this illustration to show the danger of not knowing the signs of his coming. That those who aren't aware of the signs will be misled and then will be destroyed just like the wicked in Noah's flood. Jesus then gives us another illustration to explain the second problem, the danger of not realizing that Jesus could return at any time after the signs are completed. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. In this illustration, the master and the thief, the head of the household falls asleep and his house is robbed. He let down his vigilance. So Jesus told two back-to-back -back illustrations to demonstrate the two aspects of his return that he wanted to warn us about, that there are signs that we need to watch for, and that after they are fulfilled, then he can return at any time. And we need to be awake and alert for that. Now, what's incredibly sad to me is that the majority of the church today either makes one mistake or the other in preparing for Jesus' return. Either they are not recognizing the signs or they're not thinking that Jesus' return will be a complete surprise. Some of those ascribing to the pre-tribulation rapture theory don't believe there are any signs at all prior to Jesus' return. And because of this, they will be shocked and taken by complete surprise like the people in Noah's day. But you're probably asking, wait a minute, Nelson, don't they already think they're going to be surprised? So why is this a problem? Well, it's a big problem because a couple of those signs are the abomination of desolation and the great falling away, both of which involve the Antichrist. If you don't think you're going to see the Antichrist, you will be much more likely to be deceived by him. Here's what Jesus said about that. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So the only way to avoid being deceived by the Antichrist is to be saved, to be one of the elect. Since Jesus tells us in this very next chapter that's coming up that half of those waiting for his return, half of the church are unsaved. And that's going to put these unsaved in our churches at extreme risk of never being saved. Now, you might say, hey, wait a minute. Are you telling me half of the people in our pews are unsaved? No, I'm saying that's what Jesus is saying. And we're going to explain that in just a little bit. So hang on. Now, the other major group that will have a problem is the post-tribulation rapture group. It is the opposite problem. Rather than thinking that Jesus can come at any time after the signs are fulfilled, a large number in this group think you can count the days from the abomination of desolation until Jesus' return, as indicated in the book of Daniel, like you know, 1,290 days. But what if Jesus actually comes back in 900 days or 800 days? This is the other side of the problem that Jesus indicated, the problem of the head of the house who fell asleep. For those in this group that are unsaved, because they're unsaved in that group too, this may lead to some of them giving up and giving in to the Antichrist, thinking they can't endure another day, let alone all 1290 days. Unfortunately for those souls, Jesus might have been coming the very next day if they had just endured a little longer. Now in Matthew 24, 42 through 44, Two terms are key, stay awake and be ready. Stay awake to see the signs and be ready for Jesus to return at any time. Next, Jesus told the parable of the wise and evil servants. 
the wise servant provided food for God's household right up until the return of the Lord. This is both spiritual food, the word of God, and physical food, since the righteous won't be able to buy and sell under the mark of the beast and they're going to need food. I want you to think about this. This is a real problem for those not expecting to face the Antichrist or the mark of the beast. If you don't think you're going to face the mark of the beast, and you do, then you won't put away food, and thus you won't be able to feed God's children as the Lord desires. Now in regard to the wicked servant, he says, my master is delayed. And then he proceeds to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards. For his sins, Jesus returns and cuts the servant into pieces upon his return. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen at a silent preacher rapture. This doesn't happen until Jesus' glorious return, when he raptures the righteous and then punishes the wicked. So we know that this parable isn't about the pre-trib rapture. The evil servant is also criticized for eating and drinking with drunkards. Think about that for a minute. Why is that a problem? Jesus frequently ate and drank with sinners. It is only a problem after the mark of the beast, in which you can only buy and sell if you take the mark. So the way that this evil servant is able to eat and drink with drunkards is because he took the mark. Most people miss that entirely. And this brings us to a shocking conclusion. The evil servant was a servant of the master Jesus, but he didn't recognize the Antichrist and was deceived by him and took the mark of the beast. No one could say, my master is delayed when the Antichrist is upon the earth, if he recognized him. Because at that point, Jesus is no more than three and a half years away. His master wasn't delayed. So this servant doesn't identify the Antichrist. Again, think about what this parable is really saying. The takeaway from this parable then is that the wise servants will be able to identify the Antichrist and will spend the Great Tribulation feeding God's flock spiritual and regular food. This will require getting ready now. Next, Jesus told the parable of the ten virgins. All ten virgins are trying to keep themselves pure and waiting for their bridegroom. All ten of them have lamps, but the foolish ones don't bring oil, which is the Holy Spirit, of course. Then at midnight, the darkest hour, the darkest hour of the great tribulation. A shout goes out that the bridegroom is coming. All 10 light their lamps. What are these lamps? Why, it's the light of their testimony. The wise have the oil of the Holy Spirit to keep their testimony going bright while the great tribulation rages. Well, the foolish don't have the Holy Spirit and their testimony goes out. For this reason, Jesus locks the foolish virgins out of heaven when he comes and raptures the wise virgins who kept their lamps lit. It sounds like works-based salvation. Why would Jesus ignore the foolish virgins if they were saved? The answer is they weren't saved. They didn't have the Holy Spirit, which is the only way the testimony lamps could possibly stay lit during the problems of the Great Tribulation. And the takeaway from this parable is to make sure you have a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit before the end times because once the Great Tribulation starts, it is going to be too late. It also lets us see that sharing our testimony, even during the Great Tribulation, is Jesus' expectation for us. And the next parable, the parable of the talents, reinforces this even stronger. In this very familiar parable of the talents, the master gives three of his servants various portions of his vast treasure to care for while he's on a long journey. Two of the servants invest the treasure they're given and are rewarded. One servant is afraid, and he hides his treasure, and he's punished. 
So what is this treasure? As we try to answer this, we need to remember that this parable is about the glorious return of Jesus and what he expects his followers in the time right before it. And that time right before Jesus' return includes the Great Tribulation. So although most popular Christian interpretations consider this treasure to be the many gifts from God that he has given us like musical artistic talents, money, etc., that isn't the meaning of the treasure. I don't think Jesus is casting someone into outer darkness, which is the punishment he doles out, because they didn't use their musical talent for the kingdom. So if the popular theory is off base, what is God's greatest treasure that he gives us? Something that is so valuable that not using it during the Great Tribulation causes God to punish this person by keeping them from the rapture causing a person to be cast into outer darkness. In our opinion, it's the gospel. And Holy Spirit-inspired knowledge of the scripture is a second possibility. So our testimony of Jesus based on these two things is probably the way we invest the treasure that we've been given. If that is so, what would this parable teach? It would say, Almost the same thing as the parable of the ten virgins, that during the great tribulation, the servants of the master will fall into two categories. Those whose lights of testimony shine, those who invest the great treasure that they're given, those who share the gospel despite the risk to their own lives. And then there's a second group, those that let their lights go out and those who hide in fear and don't share their great treasure. If this is true, I'm sure you have several questions. The first is, hey, isn't this work-based salvation? And the answer is no, not at all. The works are simply evidence of a previous salvation, not the basis of salvation, which is only through grace and the saving power of the blood of Jesus. However, as the epistle of James tells us, faith without works is dead. Works are the evidence of true saving faith. If you have true faith, you have the Holy Spirit within you who inspires you to do works in his name. Now this brings up a second question. Aren't we to hide during the great tribulation since sharing the gospel at that time is likely to mean death? It appears at that time we aren't to hide. We aren't to hide the gospel. We aren't to hide our testimony. Look at what Jesus does to the servant who does hide it. <laughs> Pretty severe. The great tribulation is going to separate those with saving faith from those who only believe that Jesus is God but don't have faith to do something about it. Those who haven't truly been saved. The final illustration that Jesus gives us after presenting the signs of his return in Matthew 24 is the sheep and goat judgment. Again, this seems like a work-based judgment to those looking at it on the surface. Jesus separates the Gentiles based on how they treat the least of these his brothers. Look at the list of things Jesus recounts. Visiting people in prison, feeding them, giving them water, inviting them into your house, and giving them clothes. Now imagine these things during the Great Tribulation. Can you see how dangerous these things will be? During that time, Corey Ten Boom took Jews into her house during the Holocaust, and it cost most of her family their lives in concentration camps. And Corey herself didn't die, but she spent years in those camps. During the Great Tribulation, it will be like that except on steroids. People running from the Antichrist will need food, water, clothing. And what will be the punishment for those helping them? likely death or imprisonment. But this is what Jesus expects from his true followers, to share the love of Christ despite the risks. And we learned in the other parables to testify about Jesus. And this is exactly how Satan is overcome. And they overcame him by the blood of a lamb, the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives even when faced with death. So how do we prepare for these things? 
How do we prepare ourselves and our families? Click right here to keep watching and discover not only what Jesus expects, but how to prepare to live a life like Corey Ten Boom during the most challenging time in world history. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.